And the purpose of this series is to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. Each month, we will host a new research institution to learn about their work advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Today's seminar will set the stage of the current state of the field and uh, propose a roadmap for moving forward. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the president of Engineering for Change, and I'll be your moderator for today's seminar. The seminar you're participating in today will be archived on E4C site and also on our YouTube channel. Both of the URLs are listed here for your reference. E4C members will also receive invitations to upcoming seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C team at research at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to take a moment to invite you to join us in the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Seminar Series. Now, before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities around the globe. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. Uh, you can visit our website to learn more and sign up. E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by E4C fellows annually on behalf of our partners and clients and delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. We invite you to visit our research page, uh, the URL is listed on the slide here, to explore our trend analysis, research collaborations, and review the state of engineering for global development broadly. If you have research questions or want to work with us on a research project as a research fellow, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. And I'm really excited to share with you today a new challenge on E4C, which is focused on expediting solutions related to the United Nations SDGs for zero hunger and clean water. The Innovate for Impact Siemens Challenge aims to nurture breakthrough ideas and apply human-centered design approaches to engineer innovative hardware solutions that help achieve SDGs 2 and 6 by 2030. We invite you to learn more and submit your ideas uh, on our dedicated microsite uh, at engineeringforchange.org forward slash Siemens Challenge. Applications will open in February to all E4C members. Now, a very, some very important housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we'd like to take a moment to practice with you using the WebEx platform. So I'd like to invite you to please right now type into the chat window what part of the world you're joining us from. The chat window is located on the bottom right of your screen. If you're not seeing the chat window, please just take a look for the icon which is in the bottom middle of the slides. Um, I'll start us off here already. Um, so again, if you're not seeing the chat window, uh, look for that um, icon in the middle, uh, bottom of the middle of the slide. So we have folks here joining us from all over the states, in New York, Denver, Oregon, New Hampshire, as well as abroad, Rwanda, Belgium, Indiana, Washington State, Minneapolis, uh, UK, and so forth. So glad to have you all join us today. Please do continue to share with us where you're from. I do see some folks also answering in the Q&A window. Please note that the Q&A window is intended for um, actually uh, questions from the presenter so we can keep them all organized. So please do uh, answer that question in um, our chat window. Welcome everyone from Berkeley, from uh, more from the UK, Chicago, India, 
and so forth. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as I noted, uh, the chat windows for comments, concerns, or issues are just to talk to other folks who have joined us today. Any questions so we can keep track, please put them in the Q&A window. We will address all questions and have a discussion at the end of the presentation. Now, with this, I am so thrilled to introduce to you um, Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman, who is the Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Michigan. He earned his PhD in Mechanical Engineering in 2014 from MIT. He also holds an SM in Mechanical Engineering and a BS in Ocean Engineering from MIT. Before his academic career, he worked as a development engineer in Peru, working with rural communities and alternative business opportunities and with local doctor's offices or sorry, groups on medical device development. He also spent two years as a high school math teacher in Boston, Massachusetts. He currently serves as the Director of Global Design Laboratory in Michigan, uh, and the group focuses on developing design processes and support tools to help multidisciplinary design teams think at a systems level when performing complex systems design tasks. Um, Jesse also serves as the co-chair of the Engineering for Global Development Research Committee at ASME, and we're thrilled that he is uh, kicking us off on this exciting initiative. Over to you, Jesse. All right, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me, um, which is good. All right, uh, so uh, just thank you again, everyone for joining from everywhere and taking time out of your day to do this. Um, I'm just going to, I think, did you make me the presenter so I can do the slides now? Ah, yes, I will take care of that right now. Thank you, Jesse. There you go, you should be all set. I'm uh, the presenter, great. So I think, I can do this. All right, so uh, just gonna, I'm gonna give a quick talk on some preliminary work we're doing uh, that one of the outcomes is this seminar series that we're participating in right now. So I wanna thank all of you for doing it because this has been an idea that has been sort of kicking around for over the past couple of years. And so to actually have it be in fruition and have a lot of people attending from all over the world uh, is really, really exciting and um, we'd love to see it. And I think this is an important step in growing our research community and really working together uh, towards a poverty free or you know, alleviate global poverty in, an, in a substantive way and achieve uh, the SDGs like we're all trying to do. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today is some work that we've been doing around the research community itself. Um, and so the, the title of this talk is just Engineering for Global Development, Where Do We Go From Here? And I really want to, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking and I really wanted this to be more of a discussion. I wanna introduce why we're doing the seminar series, some of the research that we're doing that we're going to uh, submit to journal uh, relatively soon, but I wanted to sort of workshop it with you um, and really present sort of the type of style of talk that we are looking for in sort of the seminar series. So this is, this really is a chance for us to communicate more frequently uh, as a research community and really, really get to know what other people's works across the fields are. So let me just get into it as to why we started the seminar series and why we're doing the, the research that I'm going to be presenting to you today. So the motivation really is that we've been talking about doing something, engineering for global development, um, design for the developing world. There's lots of different names for it. We've been talking about it for a long time, about using engineering to try and, uh, and technology to try and improve quality of life and, and alleviate global poverty. And you can see that uh, going back to the 40s, but you know, a big step forward was sort of Schumacher Small was beautiful, talking about appropriate technology. Uh, we've had a bunch of papers. So if you just look for, um, I have five examples here. Uh, this is the guest editorial from uh, Winter and Madsen in the journal of Mechanical Design, sort of arguing for engineering for global development as a, as a research area for engineers. Um, Evan Thomas, who's the co-chair uh, of the research committee, did a great paper on sustainability this year, uh, talking about a field of global engineering towards that, that we should be working towards this goal and having a discipline around global engineering. And then uh, also the sustainability of this year, engineering for peace and diplomacy by, um, I don't want to mess up people's names, but Amade, uh, 
you know, really, again, talking about how we should be using engineering to try and reach these, these goals, right? And calling for sort of a new field, new research into this. And so based on that sort of motivation, my sort of view of it, if I had to summarize, they all have different tacks and different focuses, but if I had to summarize that, I would say that current engineering research is about the development of analytical tools, empirical models, and design methods, right? So we're trying to create original scientific knowledge that allows us to, to use these tools to make predictions and to make physical systems. Um, and then we try and apply these in the EGD context, in this global development context. And I think, you know, we just import these design methods, these analytical tools, these empirical models on problems, you know, to try and solve the, you know, sustainable development goals or achieve those goals or, or do other things like that. And I think what we found in experience is a lot of times these fail in some way, right? So the design methods, don't take into account user needs appropriately, or there's something about the context in which the predictions that we make about how effective these technologies are gonna be uh, doesn't really work. And that can be in the implementation, that can be in supply chain, and in a lot of different ways that many, many of us, and you know, all of you attending here, either have experienced or have written about or researched. So I think what we're talking about, what these papers are really talking about is we need new research. We need uh, engineering for global development or global engineering. We need a new research discipline in which we can create analytical tools, empirical models, and design methods, which really give us good predictions and help us design systems in a way that is going to be effective in these contexts. Um, and I think that you know that's sort of my goal, my understanding of what those papers were sort of trying to motivate us as a community to do. So to achieve these goals, um, we need to develop the field intellectually and grow our research community, which is why I'm so excited that there's so many of you here. I know you're already out there all working on this really hard, and I just want to get us more together, more cohesive, and I, I want to sort of talk about what does this mean. So when I think of engineering for global development as a discipline, and I don't know if you've had this experience, but I certainly have this experience a lot, is, um, and I don't know how well this shows up on, on people's screens, but you can, this is just my representation of a number of the fields, and there are more, um, but a number of the fields, so energy, design, health, transportation, agriculture, sanitation, water, architecture, ICT, right? So all of these supply chain, all of these are fields in which engineering for global development work is happening, right? And uh, the, the problem is, is that I continually am surprised where I find some, some work that's really, really interesting to me, and I'm in the design field, I'm a design researcher. I find some work that's very, very, I'm on the app but can't see the slides. Okay, we can, can is that true for other people? I just wanna make sure that if I'm referencing the slides, people can see them. We can, we can address that separately, Jesse. Okay. Uh, our admin yeah, will continue. take that question. Yeah, I'll just, Thank I'll, you. I'll just continue. Um, so when we're looking, we're, when we're looking at, at all of these fields, what, what I'm seeing is, is that there's engineering for global development work happening in them, but we're not necessarily communicating all that well across these different subfields. So I'm finding someone who's been working on, let's say, transportation, engineering, global development, and transportation for years, and I haven't read their work before because I'm not reading those journals specifically, and I run across them in some other way. And now that happens all the time, but I think that in each of our own fields, we're sort of, in, our, in the subfields, we are you know, trying to talk to our home community in a way in which we may be the outlier, and that there's a lot of lessons that can be learned by other people that are working in energy, that are working in health, if I'm in design, by learning from them and their methods, and so I think Part of the reason for the seminar is to try and the seminar series is to try and increase the frequency of the communication between these different ones. So, uh, you know, sort of based on that motivation and seeing all of those papers that kept, you know, every three to five years, somebody writing, hey, we should have a discipline that's designed for development or global engineering or engineering for global development, really wanted to understand what is the current level of maturity of the EGD research community. So if we look at engineering for global development as a discipline, what is the level of maturity of that discipline and what factors should be improved to develop the field intellectually? So 
we want to move forward. And again, the, the name of the talk is where do we go from here? I think we're all in agreement that we should be doing this work and that new work needs to be done. New scientific knowledge needs, needs to be created. But how do we do that as a research community? Because we can't do it on our own. So uh, two great reports uh, helped us do that. So, so Yana uh, mentioned them uh, earlier, but uh, the State of Engineering for Global Development uh, by region. So this E4C report, really amazing work. Just And, and, and I, I see it as a first step towards really understanding what is going on in our field communally, um, in our research community. And I really, uh, the link is in the slides up above. Uh, and I, I believe these will be available later so you can see it. But I would encourage everybody to go read that report. I find it fascinating. It goes through all the different programs that um, are both courses or degree programs, but also uh, a first stab at who is in this community um, that's doing research in this community, what, what faculty members are doing research in this community, what researchers are doing it. The other one is the 50 breakthroughs. I believe the link is also up above, but, but maybe not, um, which is uh, you know, a report on what are the 50 breakthrough technologies. So this is a start towards this idea of, as a research community, what are the big questions that we should be trying to answer? And this is giving us an idea as to, okay, what are some of the technologies we should all be trying to work towards? And those are listed here as to really make a breakthrough towards the sustainable development goals. Um, so I took that as a first step and I said, okay, well, let me look at what, what does it mean to be a discipline and to think about the maturity of a, dis of a discipline and what is necessary to try and improve it so that we can create scientific knowledge that's useful from an engineering perspective. So if you look at Krishnan 2009 uh, as a paper, and this is sort of a, a model, a conceptual model about disciplines as a whole, scientific disciplines, is that scientific disciplines at the end of the day are about an object of research. So there's some object that the discipline is dealing with. In our case, I would say that's physical uh, artifacts or, or machines if you're a mechanical engineer, although there's some, some discussion about that within the discipline. And again, this is all about building consensus and having things that you can build on each other's work. So you need an object of research. You then need specialized disciplinary knowledge that you are using to examine or investigate that object of the research. And that specialized disciplinary knowledge consists of theories and concepts, languages and terms, specific languages and terms, specific research methods that are uh, common to your field, and institutional manifestations, so courses, degree programs, et cetera. So when I think about engineering for global development, um, yes, I think this is good. So we want to predict technical performance in an EGD context for these physical artifacts or services. And what we're looking at, what we've done in sort of this, this preliminary work that we're working on that we will, be, we will be submitting to a journal soon, is to look at, um, as a methodology, to look at these four areas listed by Krishnan and say, what is the state of engineering for global development research in each of these four areas? So thinking about theories and concepts of so the theoretical foundation for engineering for global development, we're looking at doing a descriptive review of the literature. So that means sort of that meta-analysis where you, you look at all of the papers in a literature survey and you try and code them in different ways to see how to measure what are the theoretical foundations of the field. We'll be looking at an analysis of keywords from the literature in terms of see, do we have common specific languages and terms? Are there commonalities against across people that are doing research in this space. Uh, we've looked at literature that has looked into research methods. So, you know, we're just building on what other people have done, talking about where are there gaps in specific research methods for engineering for global development. And then that E4C report that I mentioned earlier, we're looking at that for the institutional manifestations. So for counts of, you know, how many degree programs, how many courses, uh, how many programs can you see um, that, that that are specific to this discipline. And there's a lot of those, so I think we're doing quite well in that area. So in the descriptive review, and I'm just gonna give you a, a few numbers here before I get to the recommendations. Um, there's gonna be more on this in the paper that we submit, um, but I just wanted to give you again, sort of workshop with, with you guys, get some feedback and really have a discussion around this, is I took the E4C report, and this is just a sort of a picture, it's not a complete table, 
Um, so the people that are in mechanical, industrial, and systems engineering that do work in engineering for global development, and it just had a list of them. So we took that and we used that as a basis to go uh, scrape Google Scholar for all of the papers and conference papers, journal papers that there were citations by these by these authors that we could find. We took that, that database and then selected out, cut down to the ones that were specific for engineering for global development. And just some preliminary numbers. So of those, and now this is not a comprehensive review because it is only the authors listed in the E4C report. Um, so obviously there's a lot more work that's happening that's not captured in that E4C report. But we found 364 journal papers and book chapters, 421 conference papers, um, and, and a lot of other patents and, and technical reports that aren't captured in those numbers. So what we found is that 12%, and this is again a preliminary number um, because we need to do sort of the inter-rater agreement. Uh, this is just one person coding right now. Uh, about 12% of the journal papers are theoretical. Um, and that the most cited are from, so yes, so that's a great point. So we're, if this was the E4C report on North America, so it is not global. Um, so we haven't looked in French or Spanish. And I know that the, the European sources are much more developed in my opinion. Um, again, this is why this is just a preliminary one. And that's a great point. So uh, thank you, Virginia, for, for pointing that out. I don't know if that was to everybody or just to me. Um, so the question was, uh, are we looking at non-English sources? And the answer is no, we're only looking at American sources at the moment. So the research community on this in America, um, in the Americas. All right, so, uh, and the most cited ones are from the energy subfield. So the point here is that most of the papers that we found, and this is sort of the big result from this, are results from field studies. So they're descriptions, case studies of field work. Is, uh, in my experience, the majority of what I read and what I see people performing. So there's not a lot of generalizable theoretical work being produced from those that are specific to engineering for global development. Um, and this chart is smaller, I guess, maybe when I imported it to the to large one, it didn't grow. But this is just a growth over time. So you can see that um, over the years that we've been, we've been growing in terms of journal papers uh, per year in this particular group uh, has been growing over time. Um, in terms of specific languages and terms, um, so these are just all, all of the keywords that are talking about engineering for global development. You can see here uh, just a number of the ones that are being used. And I think one of the, the outcomes of this, we haven't done a statistical analysis of it yet, but it's pretty clear that there aren't a lot of common keywords. So people are in own language when they're tagging it in the journals, and that makes it very difficult to find. Um, so there hasn't really been a consensus built over time that we should call it this, um, and this is how you can go and find it. Now, these all terms have different focuses, I would say, um, but I think the point remains that we don't have a, a consensus built on specific languages and terms. Uh, to give you one great example, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion of what it means to be resource constrained. So, so does engineering for resource constrained settings is a common term. Um, but what that term means is, you know, has not really been defined. Are we talking about less than $2 a day, $5 a day, $1 a day? Um, there's lots of different ways people slice the population and, and use that term. So even when we're using a common term like resource constrained settings, which not everybody uses, but of the people that use it, when we looked into it, we weren't getting a lot of commonality on even what that definition meant. Um, so in response to sort of our feeling this way, we went and did a pilot uh, workshop in, in New York at Impact Engineer. Uh, in last October, and we had 30 or to 40 participants discuss what is the main research questions to be addressed by the community, what does it mean to be rigorous, and again, that talks about the theoretical foundations, the specific languages and terms, and the specific research methods, and then what is the community trajectory, so where should we be going as a research community to try and grow this? Um, spoiler alert, having a seminar series where we all talk to each other once a month was one of the recommendations. 
So uh, we're already on checking that box, but I think there's plenty of other work to be done. Um, here are some of the sample responses that you're we're gonna have a fuller picture of in the paper where we talk about what people said at this workshop in terms of theories and concepts, languages in terms of research methods and institutional manifestations. Um, some of the big things that came out of it is how do we create generalizable work? So if I have a very context dependent result, how do I understand that if I have someone working even in the same subfield, but especially across subfields, so if someone's doing an energy project in Rwanda, how can I, what lessons can I take from that in a generalizable way that I can then use when I'm doing a water project in India, right? Or I'm doing a water project in Michigan, right? Um, you know, these are some of the questions that we want to be able to answer if we're going to be, uh, you know, a very useful discipline. Um, and so the recommendations from both sort of the preliminary work that we've done on this paper, but also uh, from the workshop was that we believe, or at least I believe, that we should be moving up in the research categories. So Friedman has his research categories where he talks about basic research, applied research, and clinical research. And so that would be, you know, field work versus application versus theory. And I think we need to be moving more towards the spectrum of basic research where we can start to make some generalizations that say, when we're doing engineering for global development, these are some of the things that you want to think about, you know, and understand how context affects that. But I think that currently uh, the majority of the work is just reporting, this is the context that I'm in, this was my result. And it's, and it's hard to take lessons across discipline, uh, across subfields, but also across contexts. And even at that level, it's hard to know how people define each of those contexts. So I think we need a lot of work to try and build a consensus. So I am very excited that you're all here and I'm very excited that we're having this type of communication so we can start to work together to answer those types of questions. Um, and then the final recommendation that I think everybody talked about and really came out of our paper was again, this lack of frequency of communication, mainly because we're in these silos where you would expect that, you know, citing in other people's work in journals, that that builds this consensus over time. And it may be that engineering for global development has just not been around long enough, but I would argue that we've been around since the 40s or, you know, worst case, the 70s, um, and we still haven't built consensus over that time, and other fields have. And so I think that what we need to be doing is building structures that allow us to communicate uh, across these silos and, and subfields and really get into a place where we can be citing each other, learning from each other and creating generalizable theories so that we can be a mature discipline and a useful discipline. Um, and I think that that was my last slide, if I'm correct. Yep. That was my last slide. And um, I really just wanted to, you know, that is sort of the motivation for why we're doing the seminar series. Um, and it's some preliminary work on a paper that we're putting together right now about the maturity of our field and where we need to go as a discipline. Um, that's looking at a descriptive review and some other statistics to try and make a case for, we should be communicating more frequently and building consensus in these areas. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions or, or comments about where we should be taking it. Um, and be, but before I do that, can I plug, is there, yes. Uh, next month's presenter is Professor Ritha from, who's the Vice Provost for Creative Inquiry uh, at Lehigh uh, University. And, um, you know, I had a great opportunity to meet with him at Impact Engineer and speak with him. And I'm really excited about his talk. And I just want to encourage all of you you have work that you're doing. It doesn't have to be finished work. Obviously, I haven't presented a finished paper today in this seminar. Um, I really want this to be a way that we can talk to each other and learn from each other and improve the quality of research that everybody is doing. All right. So, uh, Yana, do you want to take back? Can yeah. Take back? Oh, no need, no need make... for, to give me control for now, but I did want to invite our listeners uh, to uh, submit their questions uh, so that we can uh, pose them to Jesse. So we already have one up um, specifically. Are there examples of other fields that communicate across silos to build consensus and be have become a mature, useful discipline? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think any discipline that you look at has gone through this process, right? So physics, this happened 300 years ago, two to 300 years ago. Um, and, and has continued to happen. But uh, more recently, 
if you look at, say, aerospace engineering coming out of, you know, uh, mechanical, um, if you look at public health, uh, which came out of medicine and, and some other statistical work, combining those in an interdisciplinary way to create a new discipline, say more recently and perhaps more, more focused within our realm of experience, I would say ICT uh, D, so uh, Information and Communications Technologies for Development, has gone through this process more recently and is something that has sort of mainstream journals and a, and a, a healthy research community in which everyone knows these are the main conferences we go to, these are the journals that you publish in, and there's a, a I, I wouldn't say complete consensus, because that's never all that useful, but a strong consensus in the sense of these are the norms as to what is rigorous research within that field. I don't think that those norms have migrated out of, say, schools of information or from CHI, uh, the CHI conference, over to other conferences like IDTC, which is where I go uh, in the ASME universe. Um, I don't think that we're necessarily reading and citing those papers or using those norms. But I would say ICTD is, a, is something where they went through this process relatively recently, and people that I've talked to within that community have described how just a few people got together and said, let's have a special issue, let's have a conference so we can start to have a place where we communicate and generalize from each other's work. Right. Um, another question related to that, is there a sense of why the UGG community has not developed generalizable theories um, from the 40s or best from the 70s and some of the key inhibitors to that? Sure. So, I mean, there's a, there's, <laughs> it's a complex problem, right? So, um, I think part of what we're trying to do in this paper is to try and identify what are those obstacles, right? What is lacking in terms of a discipline? Because I think there are a lot of institutional manifestations, for example. Right? There are a lot of courses, a lot of degree programs, right? And you mm -hmm. would think that, okay, well, I have a degree program, I should have some theoretical grounding for, for why this degree program is this, but I think that it's very experientially based, right? So it's very practice-based, which is okay, right? Like, I'm not saying that you absolutely have to have a theoretical foundation to do anything. Um, I think that there's some, yes. Uh, I'm going to answer Bob's question in, in, a, in a second, but just to finish this thought, um, I think that there's some there's some parts of it are looking at how the funding has happened. So you know, if you don't have a funding source, so you know, funding drives a lot of how scientific research happens, right? Mm -hmm. And again, you can't give a, a unified presentation to funders if you're across in all these subfields and trying to convince funders in those particular subfields. That, that your stuff is important, right? So I think that we're seeing a shift in demand from students and demand from funders uh, and also research outlets to try and do this. Um, and I think that that has been an inhibitor in the past, but also these, uh, you know, global development work is, in my view, inherently interdisciplinary, right? So you need, you know, a good understanding of the entire structure. So you need social scientists, you need economists, you need engineers uh, in order to really make predictions about whether a technology is going to work or not, be adopted. And I think that that's always a much harder problem than it is if you're just within engineering trying to do tensile strength, for example, right? So, that, you know, everyone's in the same discipline. We all sort of agree this is the problem. This is the approach. And when you're doing interdisciplinary, I think it just becomes harder because the language becomes harder. You have to spend more time. It's slower. And I think that those don't lead to the incentive structures that we have currently set up in, in research communities. That would Absolutely. be my answer. Yeah, that it needs some um, new approaches, new techniques, which is entirely so what we're going to arrive at. So the, um, another question that came up relative to strategy, right? Yeah. Noting that strategy always, the ans always answers the question, how? So right. have you given some thought to the strategy for how we might reach across the silos? And you, you've spoken to a little bit of this already, but maybe you want yeah. to expand. So, so the first thing that, that I would say is the, uh, the seminar series, right? So my idea, just in terms of what I could do on a personal level, was I was like, I really want to hear from and talk to and hear about the work from people that, you know, maybe I've read or come across. I just want to do it on a more frequent basis than once a year at, at IDTC, which is how I was doing it before, right? And I wasn't getting all those people in the different fields. So 
my decision was to create this structure here as a seminar series so that I could, if I came across somebody that I was interested in their work that was in a different field, I could just invite them and say, hey, come give a seminar. It doesn't have to be finished work. Just come. It's once a month. It's at this time. Sign up for a slot. I'd love to hear what you're doing. Right? So that's, that's one way of communicating across these silos. I think the other thing that came out of the workshop um, and also in the literature is sort of because it's inherently interdisciplinary, um, you know, outside of engineering, but also within engineering, I think that these institutional manifestations are one way in which this is happening, right? So if you look at, say, the Blum Center at Berkeley or, um, you know, what we're doing here in the Center for Socially Engaged Design at Michigan, right, is we're, we're reaching across and using these institutional manifestations as a way of, you know, in teaching students, as a way of getting these collaborations. I think that what we need to do um, and what came out of the workshop was across institutions and making it specifically about research. I think a lot of, even the publications, when you look at these journal papers, a lot of them are about the education aspect. Um, so teaching students how to do this and not necessarily just researching how to do this, um, to how to work in this space. And so I think in terms of answering the strategy question, I think what we need to do is build structures around, and perhaps this is through ASME or other ways, um, one of the things we're talking about is, do we have a special issue uh, for a journal in which everyone submits papers through a conference? Everything from that conference gets automatically submitted to the special issue. So I think that's one way that happened in ICTD um, that, was, that was told to me. So I think that's one possible mechanism. The seminar series is another mechanism. And then building those things into research collaborations across institutions, I think is gonna be important. And I think also trying to turn these, I think we've, we've, because it hasn't been mainstream, have gone into the education space because students have been demanding it. I think that we need to now continue to say, can we do this in the research space? And how do we build funding streams and other things there and share uh, knowledge across that so that we can really make something that's effective? So right. I think those would be the three things that I would say. Those are excellent points. And of course, we, we want to invite, you know, those of you who are listening, if, if you, have examples of, um, of your own that you'd like to share, you know, we'll welcome them uh, either via chat or as follow-up via email. Uh, you know, it's ultimately, we're not suggesting that we are the keepers of all truth and all, all data. It's, it's obviously a really dispersed uh, multidisciplinary field. So there are a lot of things going on that we're just not yet aware of. And this is our attempt to start to aggregate that information uh, by first and foremost talking to all of you. So, uh, you know, we will be stronger in our understanding with additional data points. So, uh, and on that note, Chris uh, just noted uh, in our chat that special issues are an option for the ASME Journal of Mechanical Design, of which he's an associate editor. Um, to do special issue, typically uh, 40 submissions are needed and roughly 20 are accepted. And I think we can talk about some of the challenges associated or the kind of the realities associated with the, doing special issues of any sort. Um, yeah. And uh, this is this is kind of a concrete, um, you know, aspect of the work is that you know it's inherently a heavy lift. Yep. Um, all right. Um, any? I, I don't see any additional questions. Um, uh, from the audience, I just want to give it one more minute. Um, we did want to, our intention with the seminar series was to, to keep it quite um, um, brief as, and uh, not, not be the typical academic event where people drone on, no offense to all the academics obviously here. So uh, we, we are looking to wrap this up in a few minutes. So if you have any burning questions, please put them in. I see some stuff coming in, so give me just a moment to get to that, but we will wrap in about five. So, um, oh, uh, someone requested just a, a repeat of the name of the magazine or special issue. I think uh, if you look in the chat, please do look above. You'll see that it's listed there. Um, if you're not seeing the chat, it is the ASME Journal of Mechanical Design um, that uh, where there are special options, uh, as where there are options for a special issue. Uh, one more question: How can you? How can we include researchers and students from developing countries? They are much more intimately connected to engineering for global development um, problems than academics in the United States. That's an excellent question. Yeah, yeah so uh, it's an excellent question. I think that there's um, a bunch of initiatives, uh, for example, through the Design Society. I know of one that just started 
um, you know, design by Africa, uh, Africa design. Um, there's a lot of research happening in universities overseas, um, the overseas from my perspective, to be clear. Uh, I think that we have invited for this seminar people uh, from, from other universities, uh, including in uh, other, from a variety of countries and, and contexts. I would say that I think that it's a really important question to think about who is doing the research, who is on the research team, and what does that mean, right? How is that interpreted in the results? And I think that um, I would say that, you know, that is something that we need to focus on. And we are trying to do it in our own, you know, in this seminar series by inviting people. Um, if you know of researchers that we have not invited that you would like to suggest to us from a particular university, as Yana said, the whole purpose of the seminar series from my perspective when I came up with the idea was to meet as many people as possible and learn from them, right? So that's across context, across universities. We're trying to make our, our presenter list representative of that and anyone that can help us do that, we would really appreciate it. So I think that's one step. I think the next step is then to think about how do we have um, you know, our own research, I haven't presented my other research, so I, for example, am doing uh, research in Thailand where I'm collaborating with the School of Public Health here and collaborators from a Thailand university. So, you know, in my view, we're always trying to have collaborators, academic collaborators from wherever we're working that are really going to help us. I know Michigan does that through their Ghana program, um, you know. I just think that that's what we need to do is to build those research collaborations so that we're all learning from each other. Absolutely. And um, one of uh, another question has come in. Um, one of the points from our listeners is there, there are a few other areas where you might want to think about building out the strategy, namely language codification, which I think you're also noting in terms of terms, process standards, uh, funding measurements, um, and just uh, war stories in the sense of, you know, failures, I think, is really what this listener is thinking about. Um, so another uh, question is, recommend are there any recommendations to overcome the problem of language differences between disciplines? Um, those are the causes of, of many of the silos. Yeah, so that definitely may be a cause of the silo, as I said, interdisciplinary work. So research into interdisciplinary teams has, you know, has sort of said this is a one of the inhibitors of interdisciplinary work is you have to spend extra time trying to learn those differences. I think one of the things that I found in reading a lot of these papers as I'm doing this, this descriptive review is that there isn't necessarily um, a norm around defining the terms very precisely. So you might read, I've read a lot of papers that say, this is, uh, you know, design for resource constrained settings, but then they never define what do they mean by resource constrained settings in their paper, right? Um, in the way that they might define, okay, like I'm talking about, you know, these are my symbols in my equation and I'll define those for you, right? So I think that what we need to do across disciplines is start to really be precise in our language and reporting what we have in that and if we can make it a norm so for example if we do a special issue in say jmd then we could make it such that everybody ahead of time when they're submitting knows hey you need to have this glossary where you report these things and i think that's the discussion what should we be reporting right about the context that we're working in so that people can understand it um and i think that yes it takes more time it's harder to do but i think that there are mechanisms for sort of enforcing that if we do it in a single place where we're, we're publishing. Um, but I think, again, each in our own work should be really thinking about and reporting as precisely as we can, what do we mean by each of these things? Okay. Agreed. Well, I think this is a great note to end on, um, Jesse. We, I do want to point out that in the chat, there's also uh, some really uh, great uh, recommendations. Uh, there's one last question that I'm just going to throw out there um, just because it's so, such a good uh, point and then I think we'll have to close it out, which is, are you only interested in learning about research in this area or do you want to talk with organizations who are working in this space, specifically in the health field? 
Sure. So I think that my particular research is very based on, on practice, and I think design research in general is. So I'm always interested in talking to practitioners and understanding what is the research that we need to be doing. Uh, in particular to the seminar series and to the paper that I'm presenting, I'm talking just about research and the narrowing the scope from how do we do engineering for global development to how do we create original scientific knowledge within engineering for global development. Um, but by necessity, that scientific knowledge to be useful, uh, I think certainly all sorts of organizations and stakeholders that are within this space should be working to try and define that research agenda, right? So I'm not saying that, you know, other organizations need to be doing research, but they certainly should have collaborations between, you know, the academia and, and the rest in order to transfer that knowledge and also to, to, to define the direction of where that knowledge is going. What questions should we be answering? Right, like that needs to come from practitioners. Um, so, so absolutely, I'm interested in hearing from everybody. Um, in particular, I'm talking about research because that's what I am, and I try to narrow the scope as much as possible. Um, but certainly, I think that there's there's a, a spectrum of what we could be talking about here. So, thank you so much, Jesse. And with this, I definitely have to close out our seminar. I want to thank all of you for attending. It's been a really fruitful discussion and we're looking forward to having you join us for our next one. As a reminder, uh, we will be uh, having another seminar in February, specifically on February the 12th at 12 p.m. Should be really easy to remember, 12th at 12 uh, with Kanjan Mehta from uh, the Lehigh University and his work is really compelling. So the conversations will continue. We actually had responses from our research community throughout the end of 2020. So lots of exciting topics ahead. We will be sharing with you the list of our upcoming uh, presenters and the dates uh, through email. Uh, with that, I wish you all a fantastic and productive afternoon, evening, or morning, depending where you're joining us from today. Thank you so much. We'll see you on the next one. Yeah, have an optimal rest of your day, guys. Bye-bye. Bye now.